Welcome to the C45 Association's official YouTube channel. The following presentation is brought to you with support from Sigma Analytical Services with the C45 Association. Sigma Analytical is the only cannabis lab with cross-continental operations in the world and the first cannabis-focused GMP certified lab in Canada. Our service goes beyond a full panel of testing and also covers stability studies, cleaning validation, formulation and product development support, and more. We have been a front runner in testing cannabis 2.0 products and have validated methods for vape cartridges and a variety of edibles, topicals, and beverages. Sigma is also Shoppers Drug Mart's partner in Medical Cannabis by Shoppers and Ecolab's exclusive partner in Canada and South America to run cleaning validation studies for cannabis processors and producers. Our short and dependable turnaround times, in addition to accurate and reliable results and outstanding client support, has made Sigma the preferred lab for many LPs. Sigma also offers support on consulting projects for the producers and labs in Canada, Colombia, the US and beyond. From method development, validation and transfer, to support for designing, setting up, and running in-house or independent cannabis labs. For any questions or to start a discussion on how we can assist you, please don't hesitate to contact us. We hope you enjoy the following presentation and don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel for more quality content. Welcome to the Cannabis Irradiation Myths, Truths, and Remediation panel. We have uh, some amazingly smart people that I'm hoping I can keep up with today on the panel. Uh, we're going to be chatting with Nina Aka, the QA manager at Veritas Natural Health Products. Uh, we've got Gordon Dobrint at uh, QA and regulatory compliance manager at Steris, uh, and Raj Matu, director at global strategy and strategic accounts at Sterigenics. Uh, some very smart people with us today. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I know that this is a topic that is uh, near and dear to not just the science and I'm going to say the geeky people, because at the core of every risk and business plan and business strategy, we bring up the strength of your QA and the strength of, of your operations being supported by that, if not driven in many cases. So I want to start with a very high level question and we'll use this to, uh, to have you introduce yourself and just dive into the question. Um, but as you introduce yourself, please tell us. What, what do micro producers, which we're seeing as the largest number now starting to come through licensing, uh, need to understand around costs, packaging, treatment of irradiation, safety techniques? What, what do they need to know to be successful as they're coming out the door? Um, we'll start with Nina, if you don't mind, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nina Aka. I'm the QA manager, also the QAP for Veritas Natural Health Products Limited. When it comes to quality assurance before products move to the market, I believe every license holder should know that their sanitation program should be on point. When I say sanitation program on point, should know that the sanitation is effective in getting rid of microorganisms. And the input materials are also great so that we don't accumulate chemicals that stay in the product and cannot be relegated in any way. So when it comes to irradiation, I know Health Canada, the regulations changed in 2019 with new limits for microorganisms. And it seemed to us all that it was quite strict, especially when Health Canada, or we all assumed, we all interpreted the regs to mean that we have to stick with inhalation because most dried cannabis is intended for inhalation, smoking. So with these stricter limits, everyone had to look at a more effective way of ensuring that the product quality was good, met regulatory requirements before shipping. So here comes in irradiation. The limits were so strict that I believe almost every LP would not be able to meet such limits. So irradiation comes in to bring the product into the quality specification that we all require. Irradiation costs money, and there are not many irradiation companies around. So most LPs would have to ship their products for irradiation cost, um, pay for irradiation because there's a minimum order quantity. So if you're irradiation one kilogram, you still pay the, M, the order, the minimum value for that minimum order quantity, and then pay an additional fee 
for every extra gram exceeding the minimum order quantity. And then these costs also translate into the cost of the final product. When it comes to packaging, I know most companies irradiate the products before actual packaging. If the products are packaged before irradiation, yes, that's also an additional cost because of the packaging that has been done because the irradiation companies also consider the packaging material as being irradiated to further enhance safety and quality of the product. All these translate into additional costs for the LP, um, which are also transferred to, onto the cost of the product. So the irradiated product per gram will have, may have a different price than an unirradiated product per gram. Thank you. Thanks, Nina. Um, Gordon, I wonder if you could uh, share your thoughts on that and probably add on. I suspect we'll be adding on as we move through this. Sounds good. And thank you very much. So my name is Gordon Dobrent. I'm with Steris out here in Whitby in Ontario. And in terms of what we do here, I mean, we sort of touched on this point already, and this is a really key thing, is the irradiation processes as we apply them not only to cannabis, but to spices, to medical devices, drug products, anything like that. The intent of the irradiation process is not to make up for and compensate for really poor sanitation systems or really contaminated product out of the gate. The intent of the irradiation process is as a final level of additional assurance to something that was already manufactured, grown, packaged in a compliant environment. And we're just really that final check to make sure the product is safe and meeting the required specifications. So, the idea is that we don't want to look at irradiation as a catch-all in the sense, you know, you have really, really high micro counts, something's gone wrong in your production and irradiation is going to save it. We don't really want to look at it that way. We want to look at treating the product as in, you know, we're growing our product in a controlled environment. Again, healthy plants are going to have a significant healthy microbiome in them as part of being a healthy plant. Uh, so we really want to understand the micro we have and what levels we need to achieve it to and try to achieve that with really solid, good growing practices out of the gate and not necessarily expecting radiation to come and, and save it on the back end. Because um, we've seen some product come in with you know, very, very high micro counts over a million CFU per gram, and we can drive it down, but when micro levels get that high, it becomes very difficult to eliminate them um, on the back end. The other sort of piece that ties into that in terms of you know, a bit of a cost control piece, but also a product control piece, is at what stage are we irradiating? When our facility was established and sort of the irradiation model was built, it is assuming we're sort of working on what we call terminal sterilization. So we're sterilizing the product at the end when it's already packaged, ready to go. And so at that point, it's got a sterile barrier in its primary packaging so that whenever it goes into you know, storage and when it's on shelf, there's no opportunities for contamination to be reintroduced. And something we always wanna be thinking about is if we are irradiating a product at a very bulk phase, then there's all these opportunities in handling downstream from that for the contamination to be reintroduced. And, and given cannabis being such a natural product, most of the time it's going to harbor a degree of growth. So every time we have an opportunity for contamination to get reintroduced um, with additional handling, that's just another risk to the product maintaining you know, a low bio burden. So that's why we also tend to, with a lot of our products, look at them in their final packaging form before we irradiate them to ensure that there isn't any opportunity for that contamination to come back. Um, that also sort of ties into pricing a little bit in the sense of usually when you have it in its finished pack, it's a little bit bulkier um, and we functionally sort of charge by volume. So that's a bit of a challenge there. Um, the other challenge sort of in the pricing space is when our facility was built and you know how the irradiator itself is designed, it's really designed on the assumption of taking in relatively big loads. Um, you know, basically efficiency is based on trailer loads of material or at least a minimum of skids worth. Um, so like Nina had said, you know, when it's just a box or two, that then becomes very cost prohibitive because the way we segregate and control management of our products, we can't group other products all in one carrier from multiple customers. We want to keep things segregated as part of just our regular sort of good GMP um, practices to keep customer products segregated. Um, there are some opportunities there in the sense that if we look at you know the value of the product itself if you sit back and sort of do the math of you know the cost of radiation a co uh, against the overall cost of goods it does become relatively small um, i've sort of in my head roughly worked it out to be in the neighborhoods of three to seven percent uh, depending on what your you know end sale price is um, so again it can you know influence the margin and be a cost to lps and certainly from a micro producer to send us one or two kilograms to get irradiated 
that probably is cost prohibitive. Um, we're exploring different options about how we can you know, maybe adapt to that in a compliant way and have a, a better system suited to those smaller growers. Because we want to support everybody um, that's working in this space. Excellent. Uh, that has brought a whole bunch of questions I'm going to have for you later, Gord. <laughs> Over to you, Raj. Thanks, Barry. Um, as you mentioned, I'm the Global Director of Strategy and Strategic Accounts, Head of our Cannabis Division. Uh, we've got an e-beam facility in Vancouver and a Gamma facility in Laval, Quebec, near Ottawa, Ontario. Um, good points, Gordon. Uh, I'm not going to repeat. Uh, I think a lot of what we do is functionally the same. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, whether it's a micro or a standard cultivator, nobody tries to grow contaminated product. Uh, everybody's doing the best that they can to grow good, clean product that they can roll out into the marketplace. Um, unfortunately, there are challenges that are uncontrollable. That's where we come in. So what I like to call ourselves uh, silent partners. Um, just here when you need us. Some of our customers proactively process their product. Others wait for their uh, product to fail, uh, the lab analysis. It's a mixed bag, really. Um, at the end of the day, I would say that uh, mitigating risk is what we help our customers do. Um, you, you have to take into consideration as well that even if your product passes the lab analysis, if there's some contamination there, as um, there's opportunity for regrowth. So um, you really want to do what you can to control risk. Uh, recalls are devastating. And at the end of the day, that's what you want to really avoid as an LP. Nobody wants that negative uh, media attention. Uh, with respect to costs, I would say that our costs are probably in the one and a half percent range of final product retail value. So uh, the e-beam, process is considerably uh, cheaper than the gamma process. I, you would probably want to call around and do your homework on that. Don't take me at my word for that, but uh, that's just what we've been able to uh, compare over the years. Uh, whether it's cannabis uh, or hemp uh, products that we process for our customers, uh, we're able to do it in bulk or final packaging right down to pre-rolls. Uh, and we process on uh, conveyor trays that are the size of a pallet. So we do have the opportunity to run smaller products, smaller lots and loads, and uh, maintain our GMP compliance with lot segregation and all that. So um, yeah, I mean, we're open to business. We are happy to work with big and small. Uh, the approach is the same, the treatment's the same. Respect each and every one of our customers the same way. That's about it for me, I think. Excellent, thank Raj. I um, I'm in trouble already because I've got <clears throat> excuse me a whole page of questions for all three of you, and we've only just started. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'm gonna if I can, Raj. I'm gonna stay with you and cycle back through because one of the questions I have, and again recognizing that I, I don't come from a deep knowledge in the QA realm, is what's the difference between e beaming and other forms of irradiation and is there a time that you would strategically, I'm, all of my practices around risk, mitigating risk and looking at strategic operations. So I have to assume at some point, depending on the product you're dealing with, the situation you're dealing with, you may pick and choose a different type of irradiation based on, on where you are. Is that? Can you explain a little bit about the differences? And again, I wanna cycle through all three, three of you and just find out if there's a time you would use different measures to pick which direction you're going. With cannabis, I can say that uh, it's pretty much comparable uh, between the gamma and e-beam uh, modalities. With the e-beam process, it's a shorter dwell time. The product is exposed to the radio radiation uh, for lesser time. We're talking seconds compared to hours. Uh, it's difficult to say the amount of hours. Gordon will probably be able to touch on that better than me. But uh, the, the cannabis is only exposed to the beam for less than 15 to 20 seconds, so it's a shorter dwell time. Uh, the gamma method does have better penetration when you're looking at uh, more dense material products. Uh, that's usually when um, gamma is selected over e-beam. Uh, the other is location, uh, wherever your um, 
geographically closer to that's obviously a consideration as nina mentioned logistics costs play a factor as well for uh, lps so the uh, shorter Gordon? dwells oh, sorry, sorry uh, yeah. great the shorter dwell time does um, equate to less material changes as well especially with cannabis so um, at the end well, the end result is less material change of the cannabis affecting the terpenes, the THC, CBD, organolept organoleptic properties of the cannabis. But I would say either with gamma or e-beam, um, there shouldn't be considerable changes with e-beam. I know that we've actively, proactively sought feedback from our customers, uh, even done the Pepsi taste challenges where we've exposed the cannabis to a series of high doses, looking for feedback to see uh, where the connoisseurs can uh, try to determine at which point they can see the higher dose impacting the quality of the product. And we haven't had any negative feedback or anybody able to come back and say, okay, uh, a sample C through D or C through G, um, the high dose ones, here they are. It's virtually undetectable. Nice. Okay. Again, I'm, you're creating more questions for me than we started with, so this could be dangerous down the road. Point, right? Um, for sure. Yeah. Gordon, over to you. No, th thank you. Um, yeah, there, there isn't really huge gaps in the process in the sense of any irradiation process. What we're effectively doing is, and if we also think of you know more conventional devices like autoclaves and things like that, what we're doing is in a very controlled manner, we're putting energy into the product. And the energy is doing some work for us in terms of killing off microorganisms and making sure they're not propagating in the product. The, the challenge there is by putting energy into the product, we also can elevate temperatures a little bit, we can drive some chemical reactions a little bit. Um, so like Sir Raj has said, the two sort of big bucket differences that we're gonna see between us is E-beam runs a little bit faster, to, uh, I should say it's never gonna be faster, so your exposure time's less and you tend to see less of what we refer to as photooxidative stress, or basically the experience of the product being here with that energy. Again, these aren't huge differences, but just if we're sort of looking at apples to oranges, that is one of the yeah. significant differences between the gamma and the e-beam space. On the flip side of that, the, the beneficial side in the gamma space is because a, ga a gamma um, emission doesn't have any mass, has exceptional penetrating power, and so if somebody comes to us and says, you know, we have our product bulk in a barrel, in, in a very big box, something like that, a great big tote, not a problem, happy to take it. Um, we know the penetrating power in our gamma setup will we'll manage that just fine. Whereas an e beam setup, you need to be, you know, and they, again, they're very good at this and they all adapt to this. But you need to be very conscious of your cross section of your material coming through to make sure you're getting that appropriate penetrating power. And again, both, you know, sets come with some challenges, but they also, you know, come with a lot of benefits and opportunities for us to adapt to those challenges um, and, and, make, and make it happen. Thank you. And Nina, your your thoughts on this? Yeah, so um, with the different kinds of irradiation, I, I know there's been quite a bit of research testing the before and after quality of the products. And there is there hasn't been any much significant differences between the before and the after. I mean, when I mean when I say significant, nothing that is a showstopper. Nothing that will negatively impact consumers or even the LP. So I believe I am more inclined towards the e beaming because it has a much, much lower impact on the product. But then there is no significant difference between the before and after quality of the product. Apart from the so microbial. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's go there. <laughs> So is that because uh, again, for for a layman like myself, I'm look, I'm listening to you thinking, then does it literally become a logistics exercise to pick which facility I'd be ha aiming to? But if there is a difference around my microbials, then that's something we need to know so that we don't have. And especially, we have such a large group of micro producers starting to come out, and and I mean I mean no disrespect when I say that we're seeing less uh, scientifically based people involved in some of these micros. So how do we give them the information they need to make the right choice, not just whoever's closest, but the right choice for who they may send their product to for irradiation? And you just touched on that, Nina, so I'm gonna come back to you and cycle through again if there is a difference around microbials and what does that mean? 
Okay, so when I said different microbials, it meant I meant that after irradiation, obviously the microorganisms are no longer detectable or quantifiable. Okay. So with so the there difference is that the E beam and the gamma, I am not a hundred percent sure of the differences between these two. I'm sure Raj can um, highlight on those, but we go more towards the E beam because there is a lower impact on the product. It it doesn't affect the product negatively as much as the gamma would do. Raj, am I right? Correct. And I don't want to steal your thunder, Gordon, but uh, what we often hear from customers is that the THC increases due to that short excitement of uh, atoms at the molecular level uh, actually increases the THCA in yeah. the cannabis. Um, and because of the short dwell time or exposure to radiation, uh, there's no change in the moisture content. And then, hence, there's no changes to the organo organoleptic properties of the cannabis. Uh, you won't be able to detect any significant changes in the terpenes, THC, or CBD, other than that increase in the THC A after treatment. Actually, back to that micro piece. Um, interesting sort of point was raised there in the sense that you know, both EBM and GAMMA are very effective at you know, lowering that overall bio burden and really driving everything down. But what some of the micro producers that could really benefit from understanding is there is a spectrum of radio sensitivity within microorganisms. So if we think of things that live in, live in our soils and live based in the natural environment, they tend to be a little bit more hardy organisms. Um, so they, they can be a little bit more difficult to eliminate. Um, whereas some things, you know, like known human pathogens like E. coli, E. coli actually takes very little energy um, in a radiation sense to take out. So if I would say that something that, you know, um, a micro producer or really any producer would really need to know is um, not just have that very sort of vague, you know, total yeast and mold count. Um, speciation can be very effective for us trying to solve problems in the sense to understand, oh, this is, you know, this has a big, this microorganism has a big cell wall, it's a spore producer, it's very robust. Um, we know we might need to adapt to that versus something that's relatively low concentration and a particularly radio vulnerable um, species, we can then reduce potentially the amount of you know, energy we're putting into it um, to solve the problem. So when it comes to sort of that micro piece, um, and I know again, there's cost involved and testing time and you know, all that work, but the more we understand the details of what type of contamination an LP is experiencing, the more we can better respond to it. It's interesting because uh, as I've tried to over the last four years educate myself and again I, I say it often it's very true I can't grow a dandelion so I don't dare touch soil anywhere um, but uh, in dealing with my friends from several of the labs and such that the importance uh, exactly to your point Gordon the importance of testing soil and such as your operation is coming up and then testing plants so you know what you're taking and obviously is a huge piece of that whole process and efficiency if I'm hearing that right um the other thing i guess i'm hearing and and i love i love the term in our industry we've heard it for years about how many things are guaranteed i'm assuming this is a, a bit of a, a loaded question in that it, is there a guarantee that once something has been irradiated it uh, it will pass or is there a, a microbial microbial load that's too large to be remediated along the way uh let's start with nina just just to put you on the yeah. spot. Okay, so like Gordon initially mentioned during his introduction, irradiation is not a fix for a problem. So ideally, it shouldn't be because the microbial load is really, really high. Um, that's why we are opting for irradiation. It should be an extra step to guarantee quality. With irradiation, I, I know there is a limit for, for effectiveness. It depends on the dose that is being used, and I'm sure Raj can um, expand on that statement. The dose, that, the dose of irradiation, the wavelength that is being used, and the load, the microbial load in the product. So the higher the load, the higher the dose, the, the more frequent the number of runs to just make sure everything is um, killed in the product. But then the more you do it also, the more the product is irradiated. I know I mentioned that the quality is not affected in any way, but we don't want to excite the molecules in the product for far too long, which can create 
ripple effects to affect the quality of the product negatively. So the, ideally, we should always try to make sure our sanitation and hygiene procedures are correct, they are good, they are effective, so that we don't have an abnormal high load of micro, microorganisms in the product. Um, Raj, Gordon, did you have anything you want to add to that? Go ahead. Uh, with the e beam <laughs> process, the, the max amount of uh, exposure is, is two passes or twice around yeah. uh, exposed to the beam. So you're only ever exposing the product to the beam, the radiation source for maybe 20 to 30 seconds, less than that, maybe less than 25 seconds. Uh, I, I actually, believe it or not, I've never stood there with a stopwatch, but I know I've, I've counted and then we've looked at the beam shine over top of the totes or in boxes. So it's pretty interesting, but you know, it's quick enough that if you're not looking at the right time, you can miss it. Um, the effectiveness, I would say if we have the right uh, discussions uh, regarding the packaging, uh, looking at the COAs. Uh, I can say that we're usually 99, point, yeah. 99 to 99.7% effective. The challenge is that uh, there's variability in the production. So each lot, each customer is going to have different products. So we can't have a standardized cookie cutter approach to what we do and give a guarantee that it's going to uh, eliminate all contamination. So um, I think that's where some of the misinterpretation or, or misunderstanding may be. Uh, it's not guaranteed, but it is highly effective in accomplishing the desired result, which is reducing the microbial contamination. Um, yeah, there's probably lots to talk on about that, but uh, that should be enough, I think. You're going to add in there? I mean, really just to illustrate the fact that, yeah, that, that variability piece is regardless of, of your modality, that's a challenge all around. So when we look at our uh, more conventional um, sterility verita uh, validation paths that we go down for typically for medical devices, they're all contingent on a known and consistent level of bio burden. And, you know, in our natural environment, and even in something like an aeroponic or a hydroponic, you know, grow operation, there's still going to be a lot of variability in that bio burden, which is always going to be a, a bit of a challenge. Um, and especially for us, I mean, the, the way we approach, you know, our application of technology in this case is it's not a sterilizing dose as to claim sterility. You know, we need to do all sorts of validations, um, additional testing, other challenges there. Um, our cannabis space we're working as a decontaminating dose. Um, knowing that that inherent variability coming through the door is always also going to lead to a little bit of variability than what goes out the door. Uh, now, I can certainly guarantee that it's leaving the facility less contaminated than when it came in. Um, but given the, the spectrum and bio burdens as well as the spectrum of the organisms themselves, to consistently be able to say that a given situation will drive you know, a million CFU uh, of salmonella down to a thousand um, without having a conventional validated production stream before it even comes to us, that's very difficult to achieve. You guys are making my head hurt with all of this. This I'm sure everybody watching totally understands and I'm now trying to put it into a, a, a good path to, because I want to go in so many different directions and I don't want to let you guys leave for the rest of the day. Um, okay. <laughs> so if there is, is there, is there a, a magic logistics or, or a strategic piece of advice for processors, and again, I don't, don't want to just pick on micros, um, on processors for how they manage, uh, <laughs> I'm afraid we're about to write an SOP for somebody, um, how they manage the, the how, when, and why they're going to irradiate uh, a crop coming off. What, what kind of advice would you give at a very high level for an organization that's doing that? Um, and I mean, Nina, you guys do this, so I'm going to start with you uh, without sharing internal <laughs> information, but We've talked about uh, we've talked about a million important pieces of information to consider as you're moving it forward. Uh, but at the end of the day, costs seem to drive so much of what we're doing, uh, despite of the fact we're aiming for quality. So, what is the balance for that? How how does an organization put a process plan strategy in place for that? I will start with Health Canada's regulatory requirement. So the LP is allowed to choose whichever specification they want to work with. 
So for instance, we have one LP working with the EP 5.1.8, which says aerobic plate count, total microorganisms should be 500,000 or below colony forming units per gram. And then the USP is also saying the same parameter should be 200,000 or below. There will be two companies, one focusing on the USP and one focusing on the EP. For someone focusing on the EP, two, 200,000 is a pass. For somebody focusing on the USP, 200,000 is a fail. Where is the consistency in the quality of products we are given to consumers? So that's one point that's very, very important for all of us. So for example, yeast and molds, the EP allows 50,000, USP 2,000. For Veredis, we have looked at this to be, a, I mean, a, a, a confusion, ambiguity, it's ambiguous. So we want to consistently churn out high quality products for consumers. Anything that's 1,000 CFU for yeast and molds, we believe that it's going to have a ripple effect because we don't expect the product to be consumed within one day or one week. And as the product stays on the shelf, these microorganisms proliferate, they grow, they, they, they grow and expand. And we don't want that. So it's consumer care, we care about our consumers and also risk mitigation. We don't want it to go to grow too much. So compare 1,000 CFU and 49,000 CFU. 1,000 is not good enough, but 49,000 is good enough. It's so unbalanced, and that's one point that I wish could be addressed, especially when it comes to contaminants in products. Choosing the time to irradiate. Yes, I've mentioned these two standards. If as a company you want to ensure your, your quality of product is assured all the time, the company can include irradiation in its schedule, no matter whether, no matter a pass or a fail make sure the product is irradiated before you give it out to the consumer. And then again, um, Veridis was irradiating. When Health Canada said we should use inhalation limits, that is impossible to achieve because cannabis is a living material. It is not a sterile product. There is no way you are going to achieve total plate count of less than 20 CFU per gram. So we said, okay, we better irradiate before we even test. And trust me, more than 90% of LPs do this irradiation because there was no way any company was going to achieve this standard. Irradiation is great to have, but then we should also make sure that, I keep saying, our sanitation product is good and it's, we are not irradiating because the product is bad. We are irradiating because we want to further guarantee the quality of the product. Thank you for that. I, I'm, I'm making notes for the Health Canada panel now, so this will be good. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, over to you, Gordon. I don't know if you want to add to that or where you go with that. In a lot of ways, it, it, it's very parallel. I mean, part of my roles here at the facility is, is I'm also certified as, as a radiation safety officer. So, you know, safety is integrated in everything we do. And I think that, you know, Tanya, uh, your producer is looking at this. Set your plan up looking at, you know, your end user, your consumer safety. Are you doing the things in terms of, you know, sanitation, radiation, um, not introducing, you know, chemicals such as pesticides and things into the process, keeping the end in mind that that, that consumer is going to be the one that's going to be consuming the product. If you use that lens to make a lot of your decisions, it'll be surprisingly straightforward. And, and, and you know, people, you look at quality as a cost center and expense and everything like that, but it, it, it the value is there if you focus on your consumer and sort of work backwards of the levels of controls you need to have built in. Um, and there can be, you know, um, different streams here in the sense of when we think of, you know, we started out in the medical space, you might have somebody, you know, going under a lot of oncology treatments with a suppressed immune system. You need to be very, very conscious of any micro they can be exposed to because they're not really robust at fighting that off as much as, you know, we obviously like them to be. Whereas when we look at the recreational space a little bit, um, you know, you're presuming you're you know, getting a relatively healthy person, you know, consuming that product. And again, everything in our lives has micro in it. 
you know, the acceptable limits for, you know, drinkable potable tap water is, you know, 500 CFU. Um, you know, our food, you know, especially if it's not, you know, immediately cooked, there's, there's going to be all sorts of things in your food. And if people really want to horrify themselves, you know, look at things like insect part limits and things that are allowed in, in your food. And all of that is perfectly healthy because we're a natural you know, organism out in our natural environment. So it's not that micro in and of itself is a concern. It's excessive levels. And certainly if they're excessive levels and they're pathogens that we really want to be concerned and understand how those are getting in, into the system. Um, and really understanding what that effect is going to be on the consumer. If you, if you understand that and then build controls backwards, you should be in a pretty good spot. I, I love that, Gordon, because I, and again, we all come from our own, our own zones, but it, it's, it's a business fundamental to uh, be aiming at what your product is landing at and working backwards. And uh, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, Raj, anything to add to that? I think just to really simplify things, it really comes down to time, money, and risk. Uh, time, if you have all the time in the world and all the money in the world, you can go back and forth and try to play with your options. But at the end of the day, if your product release depends on a clean COA, uh, you need to send it out to be told that your product or your lots failed, uh, then make arrangements with either Gamma or eBeam, uh, have it treated, and then send that same lot a sample from that same lot out to a lab again to have a clean COA. Uh, there's time and money involved there. Um, so really think about it. Even if your your COA is passed and there's still some contamination there, um, that contamination is going to grow. It's like a loaf of bread with a little bit of mold on it. Uh, you leave it on the shelf for a couple of weeks, that mold's going to grow exponentially. Um, and that's really the same or similar type of uh, thought process that you should have just because you're within the acceptable limits. Think about the time that that uh, product may sit on a shelf and the risk that's involved if it's recalled or pulled or if a customer gets it and there's a bit of mold on it. That I don't know if it's that common or not, but it should be consideration, right? So time, money and risk. Do your uh, due diligence. Absolutely. And, and I, it's interesting. Um, that whole risk picture means so, so many different things to different people. But when we look in the food industry or so many other industries, how reputational risk, um, I mean, I, I've got a little bit of gray hair. I can remember when that was often poo-pooed at a boardroom table. And in the last decade or two, we've seen some of the largest uh, producers, food producers outside of cannabis, um, get hit by reputational risk that has brought them almost to their knees. So it is definitely something that needs to be thought of, especially in a new industry expanding globally that reputational risk is really something that needs to be looked at. Uh, not to take away from the science and to delivering quality, but it's all the same conversation. I, I've i taken away, and I'm gonna let each of you just sort of wrap up uh, as we come out after a couple of comments that I've got so that I, I don't have the last word, which is really just a bet I have going with Stephanie because I like to have the last word. Um, I mean, I've, I've heard uh, that, and this is really strong for me, that Irradiation isn't to fix something, it's an extra step to, to guarantee quality. And I really, really, I know that I will be bringing that message forward when I'm talking around business strategy, that we need to get past trying to fix issues in our processes and build the industry out on, on quality product, much as the same as other industries are there. Um, I loved your point, Nina, around sanitation programs being on point. Uh, as someone who does Health Canada attestations on newly licensed uh, facilities, it's amazing how many people uh, feel the need, and I understand its cost, feel the need to aim to the low bar just getting past the standards instead of aiming for what's actually going to help you be successful. It drives me crazy. And it's a tough conversation. Um, and I was actually very, I, I want to thank, uh, thank you guys, uh, but especially Gordon and Raj, for talking about the actual costs in that business plan, whether it's, you know, one and a half percent, three to seven percent of costs. Because again, in any other industry, uh, that cost, not to minimize it, but when it has such a huge impact on the success afterwards and downstream, is really something that should just be factored in. You shouldn't be hiding from it. It really needs to be looked at as, how are you operating? So having probably lit up a whole bunch of things that I'm, I'm touching on that could light fires everywhere, um, uh, I don't know if you, let, let's just do a quick roundtable. Anything you'd like to add as a last message before we move into the Q&A section of this? And uh, we'll go back to our original order. Nina, I'll, I'll start with you. 
Okay, thank you. Um, so I know most consumers are risk averse. They see irradiation as the devil because they are going to get uh, what they are going to get the, all the rays in their bodies when they eat irradiated food. That is a myth. It is not true. So consumers, I know we all fear what we don't know. Irradiation is great. It ensures that you are getting the best quality of products that you deserve. It's it's something that you 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 want to identify with. You want to know that your food has been irradiated. I mean, I know people who go. I've read about people who go out to space eating only irradiated food because their health cannot be compromised in any way. So irradiation does not have any bad effects on consumers. We should clear our minds from this myth. I know there are a lot of propagandists out there saying irradiated food is not good. You walk away around with irradiation. We go through airports, security scans. We are doing a lot of x-rays. We are doing a lot of scans. Nothing happens to us. Same thing with irradiated food, irradiated cannabis. Please let us educate ourselves and know that irradiation is not a problem. It is a guarantee of quality. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Over to you, Gordon. And just throw something on, on a very similar vein. I mean, we went through, you know, decades of, you know, cannabis prohibition, you know, you know people facing incarceration, really, really not, you know, doing anything against society, people not getting the medicine that they needed. And you know, we spent decades living under that unfair prejudice that was being put on, on cannabis. In some ways, radiation li lives something similar. Again, there's a lot of mis mis misinformation out there. Um, and again, you know, I, I, you know, everybody, you know, no, don't just you know take our word for it. Go out and look. There's lots of reputable resources online. Uh, the IEEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, does brilliant work. Has a lot of really good stuff on their website. Um, it's very impartial. They don't generate you know or profit anything from you know any any sort of nuclear regulatory or um, radiation industry. They just uh, act regulated on a global level. So there's some very good documentation there to really uh, help educate people, um, even without a science background, to get sort of up to speed about what's happening in how radiation you know, affects their daily lives. Because it's around you all the time. We're all being irradiated to a degree right now. Um, radiation's around us all the time. And so we just really want to you know, help everybody understand what that means um, in a given situation. And sort of to that note, and, and I think you know, Raj would certainly probably put his hand out with this as well, give us a call. We're, we're, all, we're all in the industry. We've all been doing this quite a long time. We're really passionate and interested in the science and the application of what we do. Um, Never, never be afraid to call. You know, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, you know, look us up online. Give us a call, even if you're not looking to have your product process right now. You just have background questions, want to understand the process. Um, just call us up. We're here to help, and we're always happy to take those questions. Um, I usually make you know, make the offer that if you know somebody's looking at processing, come in and see the facility. COVID's kind of derailed that, um, but again, you know, we are here to help. We believe in what we're doing, and we really want to be a benefit. Um, you know, silent partner, as it were, just a real benefit within within the cannabis space. So don't be afraid to pick up the phone. Very nice. Thanks, Thanks Gordon. All right, Raj, you get the last word today. Well said, Gordon. Um, I would say edu educate yourself. Uh, don't listen to hearsay. Uh, really try to understand what the processes are, what your options are. Talk to, talk to like Gordon said, reach out, contact us. I spend most of my days just speaking with uh, LPs, uh, micros, standards, trying to understand the process, what's involved. So educate yourself, know what you need to do ahead of time so you're not scrambling at the last minute. We're happy to help. You know, it doesn't cost you anything to call us and understand what you need to do to prepare for your, um, in case you need to bring your product in for processing. Um, yeah, like Gordon said, we usually entertain visitors and uh, I'm keen to throw my lunch under the beam and show you how safe it is. It's, uh, it's a safe process. So educate yourself and understand uh, what your options are. That's, those are the words of advice I'd, I'd leave you with. Thanks, Raj. That's a, that's a great demo picture. We almost should have a video of you walking and throwing your lunch under the beam. That would be great. All right. Thank you all. I have learned so much. As I said, I literally have two pages of, uh, of notes here for Q&A that we're going to roll into. And uh, because I saw how big a uh, uh, smile came from, uh, from Nina on that, I do have half a page of notes for my Health Canada panel. So this will be fun. 
So thank Great. you guys. Great. We'll see you in a couple of minutes on the Q&A.